Well, hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, next week, I'm going to be concluding this series on growth and talking about spiritual growth and us maturing into the things of God. We've already, over the last few weeks, covered um, about getting offended. We've covered pride, unbelief, walking by faith, and what that looks like. Looks like coming to God, believing who He is, and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And so today, I started thinking about this message um, that I wanted to share. It's, it's funny, me and Pastor Tom, we never talk about what we're going to share to each other prior to, but it's always like, ends up being so similar and almost like there is a Holy Spirit or something. But it was it's really cool um, to hear his message this morning. I thought it was awesome. In fact, when he was talking about the different leavens, like the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod, the Herodians, and leaven uh, of the Sadducees, I just couldn't help but think about all the people I know that don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit and people I've met that don't believe in the supernatural. And you always leave with one thing. They're sad, you see. <laughs> okay, anyways... Um, my, my girls laughed. Too, that was good. Anyway, so today uh, we we're going to talk about uh, when I was getting this message together, and I was thinking of a title. I had a, an inspiration come to my mind. I saw a vision inside of me of Frank Caliendo, the famous comedian, one of my favorite guys that does impression of different people. And I see him impersonating Bill Clinton and talking about how smooth Bill Clinton was and how Bill Clinton could even get you convinced that he's not even here in front of you. He would say something like, isn't here just there without the T? Isn't here just there without the T? And that's the title of my message, isn't here just there without the T? And the answer to that is a resounding yes when the T stands for transformation. See, the thing that stands between you and there, where you are right now, and especially right now in this time of quarantine, I'm pretty sure, as I've experienced, that you're well aware of your flaws. Like you, you see the problems, the issues, the things that you want changed in your life. And you see uh, Sunday mornings or throughout the week when you're reading the Bible, you're like seeing the word paint this picture. And you're like looking at yourself like, man, I am far from that. Like you see the promise of God of wholeness, of healing, of provision, of, of walking it fearlessly and boldly. And you're like, I'm none of that. And so you are here and you want to get there. And what I'm here to tell you is the way you get from here to there is via transformation. It's all through transformation. And when I think of the word transformation, the astonishing, amazing, and powerful picture comes to mind. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. I can hear your oohs and ahs at home. That is Optimus Prime. Optimus Prime, one of the greatest transformers to ever walk this earth, though they're not real. But the thing about a transformer, the thing about a transformer, is you didn't know what Optimus Prime really was until you introduced Megatron, the enemy. See, Optimus Prime and the other Transformers looked like regular vehicles, cars, and trucks, albeit cool cars and trucks, but nonetheless, cars and trucks. In fact, if it was going down, if Optimus Prime, as the semi truck was drove, driving down the 5 freeway, you would look and say, wow, look at the cool graphics on the truck, but you wouldn't think much of it. It wasn't until they encountered a difficulty that what was inside was shown outside. See, they looked like normal vehicles on the road, but they were anything but normal vehicles. They had something on the inside of them that no other car had so that when difficulty challenges came that wanted to take over the world, what was inside of them showed up to say, uh-uh, we go into war, whereas all the other cars were useless. Now, it just reminds me, I know it's a funny analogy, but it just reminds me of the man Jesus because Jesus walked this earth and you would have looked at him and you would have said, man, he's just like any other dude. He's the son of Joseph and Mary. He's just some 
some regular guy. That is until a storm showed up. That is until a sick man was brought to him or a blind man or a man with a withered hand. It is until someone who was depressed and discouraged and lost showed up where what was inside of Jesus came out. And they began to say amongst themselves, what kind of man is this? They ain't never seen a man like this before because Jesus brought the kingdom with him. Jesus brought the Holy Spirit, and it was what was inside began to come outside. And what I'm here to tell you, brother and sister, is that the same kingdom that Jesus walked in, the same spirit that Jesus was full of, the same anointing that Jesus operated in, the same father that Jesus had, the same God that was working in for him and not against him is the same God of your life, the same spirit you're filled with, the same anointing you have. Come on, it is the same kingdom that you and I live in today. There ought to be a difference between the world and the Christian, but a lot of times we don't see it, and when we encounter difficulty, we're just like the same useless other vehicles that don't stand up to fear, that don't stand up to anxiety, that don't stand up to difficulty difficulty because what we don't have inside can't come out. Mm. Turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I know you know this scripture very well, but we're going to read it again. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. God is not interested in dead sacrifices. God doesn't, isn't interested in you dead. Now, he's very much looking forward to when you get to go to heaven with him and stuff. But as long as you're here, you've got a purpose, a mission. Stay until it's done. Don't give up. Keep going. That's a word for some of you. You might be tired. You might be looking like, man, maybe I'm going to give up. Trust me. I play that in my mind. Like, you know, what if you're like, like the doctor's like five weeks to live, you know, or something. I'm like, wow, I could be in heaven in five weeks. That sounds amazing. No, you got to cast that out. You got to stay. There is fruit to bear. There are people that are in need of your anointing, of your purpose. You are not useless. There is a reason why you are here. There is a reason you are here in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of the year 2020. It was not an accident that you are alive today, but this is your and I spiritual worship to God is to be a living sacrifice. That is beautiful. I love it. It just reminds me of why we come to church on Sundays, because especially now, uh, with, with live stream and technology today, it would be very easy to consider, you know, I'm comfortable at home. I'm just going to get the word. Because a lot of the, the 21st century, ch- we're in the 21st century, yes. A lot of the 21st century church, like in America, Western and stuff, we, we've devalued the gathering together and, and overvalued feeding. Be- because in America, we're, we're excellent consumers. So we come to, ch- I, I'm coming to church to so for you to feed me. I, I want you to come so you can feed me. I need a word so I can improve my life and, and go on and, and do it. No, no, no. Don't forget that we gather together to actually minister to God. Like we are saved as priests to do priestly service. That when we come together and gather and we sing worship songs, it's not like a, a warm up. <laughs> it's not just like a intro to the message. No, it's we are ministering unto God. You know, one of the things, th- this is me. This isn't, I'm not I'm not saying you have to do this, but for us, you know, when we tithe and we give, I like to do it on Sunday. I like to do it when we come, not just during the week. You can do that. That's fine. I'm not saying it, but I like to come bringing with the other body of believers, bringing my offering, bringing my, bringing my tithe with my worship on a Sunday with the rest of the people. It's just a, it's a, it's a ministry. It's a service. It's, it's worship. Side note. Anyway, living sacrifice. Moving on. So that, uh, that a living sacrifice, holy, that's set apart, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, your spiritual worship. Verse two, now watch this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, in reading this, I found it interesting. Why does he use two different words? He uses conformed and transformed. Why did, you know, if I'm writing, I'm like, don't be transformed to the world, be transformed to God. But he didn't do that. He, he actually used two different words. One translated conformed and the other one translated transformed. 
Because there is a difference in the meaning. What Paul is saying here is don't be conformed to this world. And that word conformed in the Greek literally means to be melted into a mold. So this is what Paul is saying, is that the world is going to melt you. Yes, you are going to have life experiences that aren't that great. You're going to have things come at you. The world is coming at you. Jesus said, in the world, you will have trouble. So the world is designed, what it does is it pressures its subjects, right? It sends pressure to melt you so that it can form you into a mold. Now, there is never a more common, ununique, boring type of humanity existence other than being molded into the world mold. Oh, no, there is nothing unique about being like the world. There is nothing special about being like the world because everybody is being molded into that same mold. But you, brother and sister, God is saying through Paul, when the pressures of life come and they're trying to get you into this mold of when you're cursed, you bite back. When, when someone offends you, you get offended and live in bitterness and unforgiveness. You walk in anxiety. You walk in fear. You're not courageous. You're not bold. You're just scared all the time. And everything, you're, you're just always a victim. Listen, I'm not saying that the things that you've experienced are are. Are, are nothing. They, 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 they're a bummer. I get it. But there comes a time where you need to say, no world, I'm not going to let you put me into your mold of a victim. I am a child of God. And Paul is saying, don't be conformed to that mold, but rather be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. See, the when you begin to change the way you think, because Proverbs says, as a man thinks, so is he. So the result of your life, what your life looks like and your response to life is based on the mindset you have. And so Paul is saying, this word is a book full of God's thoughts. Take God's thoughts and place them in this brain and make them your thoughts. When you begin to renew your mind, you will begin to experience transformation. Now, this Greek word for transformation is where we get the English word metamorphosis. Y'all know what metamorphosis is from elementary school, and you learned about that caterpillar and that butterfly, that the caterpillar went, made itself a cocoon, went in there for an extended period of time, went into the pupae stage, and then from the pupae stage came out a butterfly. That is called transformation. And this is what happens when you begin to renew your mind to the word of the living God as you look one way, but you you come out something so different. When the pressures of the world come, you might just look like a normal Camaro, but when that danger hits, boom, you're bumblebee are ready to go to war. That's what happens when you start renewing your mind is you are no longer just like the world a victim and defeated, but now you're like Jesus standing up to the storm saying, peace, shut up, be still. We got some, some freedom to bring. Amen. Now, now here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. We got a lot of words like sacrifice and transformation, the pupae stage and the caterpillar into the, the, the butterfly. Is, is transformation can actually be a lot of, can be scary. <laughs> transformation means you're stepping into something you haven't stepped into before because it's very comfortable to be into a mold of the world because everybody else is in that mold. It, it's very easy to do nothing and just play the part of the victim. It's very easy and comfortable and, and known to live that way. But to step into a new new, to step into something you've never been before, to step into something that's kind of scary and at the same time will be painful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Transformation. My first point, transformation is painful. Absolutely. I, I, I can't help but think about this story this pastor shares. This woman came to the pastor and said, Pastor, you got to pray for my, you got to pray that God changes my husband. Oh, he's unbearable, and he keeps pushing all my buttons, and I keep losing my temper. I keep getting angry. And the pastor looked at her and said, Honey, we're not going to pray that God change your husband. We're going to pray that God remove your buttons. Ooh, 
if you got that, please. Listen, God is not just interested. Oh, let, me, let me make sure everything's perfect in Josh's life. Let me make sure all the challenges are gone. No, no, no. God is in heaven saying, hey, when are you going to start praying that you get transformed in the midst of the circumstance, in the midst of the husband being a jerk, instead of just trying to change him and change everybody else and control everything in your life, why don't you just let God start to do some transforming in you from bitterness to forgiveness, from, from anger to love, man, from, from fear to courage, from, from, from fear to faith. You know what I'm saying? From hopelessness to hope. You're getting it. That comes from renewing your mind in the word. Now look at this in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I got to move pretty quick because we're, we're, we're running out of time. John 15 verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now notice verse 2. Jesus is saying, your reward for bearing fruit is more pruning. Mm. Now, Jesus, I'd like that Mercedes Benz, that Rolls Royce. You know, I'm bearing some fruit for you. Can you bless me with some more blessings? Oh, I love what Pastor Tom says. that We're, too, we're busy praying for blessings, and God's waiting for somebody to pray for his family, pray for more kids, pray for more children. That's powerful. But that's the thing. The more fruit you bear, this is what you get rewarded with, more pruning. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been pruned before, <laughs> we're going to stop there. <laughs> we're not gonna we're not gonna go where we could go with that one, Pastor Tom. Don't worry. We're keeping this thing PG. But if you've ever been pruned before, it's painful. Oh, it's painful. But here's the thing: is it's not painful to the new way or the new man, it's painful to the old man. See, this is the thing: Christians in pain, sometimes they don't like it. But listen, there is no such thing as change. There is no such thing as growth without pain. If you remove pain, you'll never grow. If you're afraid of pain, you will stay here and never reach there. It's called growing pains. There's a reason it hurts when you're growing. It's a reason your gums hurt for on, on my, my daughter Shay when her teeth are coming out. She's growing. That growth always means pain. But it's not pain to the new man or the new way. It's pain to the old. It's pain to your ego. It's pain to your pride. It's pain to your way of doing things that you're comfortable. And God shows up and starts cutting away that which doesn't belong. See, there are a lot of things about me that don't belong. There's things about me that I rely on. There's things about me that I'm confident in that I don't even know I am yet until something comes up and God begins to reward where I am and bring me to another place of pruning where he begins to cut away at the fat, cut away at the things that don't need to be there. And it's painful. It sucks, honestly. It does. But it's so beautiful because that caterpillar doesn't go straight into a butterfly. That caterpillar has to go into a cocoon that's dark and tight and uncomfortable. There's always that phase in growth where you're uncomfortable and painful. But on the other side, it's a beautiful butterfly. And thinking about this and God cutting away and pruning us, I'm reminded of the statue of David. If my, maybe you, you've learned about the story of the statue of David. Maybe you haven't. But the statue of David was sculpted by a famous sculptor named Michelangelo. And he sculpted the statue of David, which is so impressively beautiful. It is absolutely gorgeous. And it's just amazing. You look at it, you're just like, how is that humanly possible that uh, somebody actually sculpted that? It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. And when he did, I think it was in the 1500s or something. And the thing is that the statue of David was sculpted from one solid piece of marble. One solid piece of marble. And the story about this piece of marble is that it was in the hands of two other sculptors years prior to where they were given the project of sculpting the statue of David. But both sculptors 
refused to do it because they found flaws in the marble. The sculptors passed on the opportunity to create something beautiful because they saw that the marble was flawed. And here comes Michelangelo, and he takes that flawed block of marble. And Michelangelo said that all it was, was I had an image of what David looked like. And so I went to work removing the pieces that didn't belong. Oh, I hope you're getting that. See, we born into this world, we are flawed. And the world gives up on you. Yeah, yeah, people are going to give up on you. People are going to say, there's no way you can change. There's no way you're going to amount to anything. There's no way you can do that. But God says, give me that flawed piece of humanity. Give me that flawed woman. Give me that flawed man. Because I, God has an image of what this child looks like. And I am going to prune him away and start moving aside and cutting away the parts that don't belong until out comes this beautiful master. Masterpiece. Oh, you don't believe me. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. God tells Jeremiah before, when I formed you in the womb, I knew you and I consecrated you and I appointed you. Isaiah 64, 8 says that we are the clay and God is the potter and he is going to work and forming us into the image that he has in mind. Ephesians 2, 10, for we are his workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus unto God. Good works, which God preordained beforehand that we should walk in them. Ladies and gentlemen, you have a purpose. You are called by God. God has an image of you and what he has created you to be and what you look like to him. It is not, you are not going to get there by letting the world mold you. You are only going to get there by being placed in the hands of the potter, placed in the hands of Jesus, the master craftsman. There's a reason why he was a carpenter, a carpenter contractor who specialized in working with wood because we as humans need to be worked on and God's going to reward your fruit bearing with more pruning because he wants to make you into a statue of David a masterpiece of what he's designed it's not about just changing circumstances amigo it is about you being transformed it is about you looking like what he's got in mind see here's the thing though we get in trouble because we hear that, and then all of a sudden we're looking at all of our flaws. And if you're honest, there's a lot. Yeah, yeah, there is a lot. You ever look at Jesus? <laughs> you look at Jesus honestly, you're like, what in the, what? <laughs> it, it's tough. And so immediately what can happen is you start trying to go to work to change yourself. Mm. I, I, this happens all the time because we as humans are not very good yet. This is part of the transformation, the growing process where we learn humility, where we say, I cannot, God, only you can. I cast my care onto you because when we go about trying to sculpt ourselves, come on, come on. Was the statue of David sculpted by the statue of David? No. You can't change yourself. You can't sculpt yourself. That's point number two. You can't sculpt yourself. You are the clay. God is the potter. He uses his hands and his chisel to transform you. He does it. Not you. He changes you. Not you. He's the pruner. He's the vine dresser. Not you. So stop carrying the weight on your shoulders of trying to change. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. How? By who? By the Spirit of the Lord. Notice this transformation. Here's that word, transformation, metamorphosis, from glory to glory, from fruit to fruit, from pruning and pain to pruning and pain, to less flesh, more spirit, less trust in self, more trust in God. This pruning, this transformation is by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of the Lord. But notice in that verse, though, that we actually are responsible to provide the chisel in his hands. We actually can live life expecting him to transform us, but we never put the chisel in his hands. We keep it in our own. 
<laughs> See, it's one thing, okay, God, you form me, but you're not giving him the chisel. This is what I mean. He said, notice in that verse, in verse 18, but we, what are we doing? Beholding. What are we doing? We're seeking. What are we doing? We're looking. What are we looking at? The glory of the Lord, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, the word of the living God, the word of is his chisel. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't put yourself and immerse yourself in this word, the chisel is still in your hand because God has given you one way and one way only by which you are pruned and that's via the word of the living God. If you don't want to get there from here, don't read the Bible. Don't meditate the word. But if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired and you're over this victim mentality and you're over the world telling you who you are and, it's, and you want transformation, get yourself in the word. Because when you put yourself in the word and you begin to meditate the word, all of a sudden you say, God, here's the chisel. Go to work on me. And guess what? It's going to hurt. Oh, yeah, it's going to hurt because that word is sharp and that word is alive and it's cutting the things off. It is molding you and sculpting you into that statue. See, in John chapter 15, which we were just there in verse 3, Jesus told the disciples, he said, but you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. I, I, it's a bummer that the translators translated this word clean instead of prune, because it's the exact same word Jesus used for pruning in verse 2. What Jesus is saying, you are already pruned. Why? Because of the word you heard. As Pastor Tom was saying, you understood it, you heard it, you listened to it, you understood it, and that word that you understand begins to prune you. Jesus said, you are already pruned because of the word you heard. And if you think about in the Old Testament, the story of Moses and Joshua and the children of Israel, where Moses delivered the children of Israel from slavery to Egypt. I mean, Moses was the dude. He was the OG. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. He wrote about himself that he was the most humble dude on the earth. And yet Moses had an objective to get the children of Israel to the land that God had promised. And you know what? Moses was unsuccessful. Yeah, Moses was unsuccessful at doing the ultimate objective. of It wasn't just about getting them out of Egypt. It was also, as Pastor Tom's been saying the last couple of weeks, getting Egypt out of them and getting them into the promised land. I find it very fascinating, the three stages. You've got Egypt, wilderness, promised land. And with the caterpillar, you've got the caterpillar, pupae, butterfly. But you see, the wilderness is actually quite important. Because the wilderness stage is where you are going to determine whether you go back to Egypt or whether you go into the promised land. Because it's in that middle wilderness stage when things don't look good, when you're wandering and wondering and going, God, where's the change? And you give up, guess what? You're going back to the old way. Let's worship. Let's find some gold and create a calf that we can worship because I'm comfortable with that. That's where I came from. That's what I know. But to serve a God who's invisible, to serve a God that, that's speaking to this Moses, I don't know about that. That's dangerous. So guess what? That generation died and they didn't get to go into the promised land. But then God called this guy named Joshua. Yes, that's my name. He called Joshua. And he said, Josh, I know you saw what happened to your mentor, your leader, the most humble man on the earth, the one that I spoke to face to face, the one that was up on the mountain with me for 40 days and 40 nights, twice. <laughs> the, this dude, and you saw how he was unsuccessful, I need you to do what Moses couldn't do. But see, right, this is where I, as Joshua, say, God, how in the world can I be successful when Moses was unsuccessful. Isn't that what we do? We look at other people's experiences to determine how far we can go. We look at how far other people have gone and say, well, they didn't go that far, so I can't go there. They didn't get that, so I can't get that. They died sick, so I can't get healed. They died broke, so I'm not going to have prosperity in my life. I'm not going to have provision. I'm not going to accomplish anything. Besides, they had encounters with God, and I've never had an encounter with an angel or with this feeling or this fire or something tells Joshua, none of that is going to ever matter. He says, Josh, I got one thing for you to do. One thing for you to do that is going to ensure you are successful from getting here to there. 
No, it's not a bigger bank account. <laughs> no, it's not more friends. No, it's not a larger network. No, it's not more business deals. No, it's not a better job. No, it's not a better career. The only way you get from here to there, and the here, that victim, here, the wilderness, here, Egypt, to there, the promised land, there, the call, there, that God has planned for you, there, the statue of David. The only way you get from here, Josh, to there, Joshua 1.8, but this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Josh, you got one thing. One way to transformation. One way to get from here to there. And notice the answer. It is not, God did not say, read my word every day. Now, I know we read that, and that's what we read when we read it. But God didn't say read it. God said meditate. Oh, there's a big difference. Come on, how many of you have struggled with some reading comprehension? <laughs> I mean, you read something, especially the Bible, especially King James Version, especially some of these things in the Old Testament. You're like, what in the world did I just read? Because it's not about just reading. Let me just get my devotion in today, read it. Let me just get my chapter in today, read it. That's great. Do it. It's a beginning, it's a start. But God is saying, you can't just read this thing. You got to meditate this thing. You got to take these scriptures and you got to put yourself in them. Put yourself in the story. Chew it. Meditate on it. Think about it day in and day out. See, the, you find me a worry wart. You find me somebody who is always worried all the time, freaking out. You found me the next Joshua. Yeah, because see, they are professions. They, they are professional meditators. They are so good at meditating. The problem is they are meditating on the wrong thing. They're meditating on the negative. They're, ne they're meditating on curse. They are meditating and dreaming and imagining a future without God, which is why they are worried all the time. But if you can bring me that person that's worried all the time, all I got to do is say, hey, replace those thoughts with the word. And when you begin imagining the same way, dreaming the same way, picturing the future the same way as you did with the curse, but now replace it with the blessing. Now replace it with the promise of God, and you begin to imagine a successful future. Why? Because it's God's word. You begin to imagine a future filled with the power of God. You begin to imagine your family members saved and your friends saved. You begin to imagine yourself living a holy life and a righteous life. You begin to imagine yourself walking in the provision of God and not being afraid of lack. You begin begin to imagine a courageous life when you begin to meditate this word. See, I've been on the shores of Galilee, not physically, but in my imagination. I've been there at the time of Jesus. I've been there on the mountain with Moses. I've been there with Joshua as he crossed the Jordan River. I've been there with John in that vision of revelation. I've been there with Paul as he traveled the known world preaching the gospel. I've been there in prison with Paul. I've been there in prison with Peter. I've felt what they felt. I saw what they saw, and I got their strength. I got their courage. I got their hope. I saw why Peter was sleeping. I saw why Paul was praying because I began to see the greatness of God in every and any circumstance that comes my way. You only get there by meditating day and night. Now, of course, you got to read it to know what it says, but reading is not the end, and it's not the quantity of reading. It's the quality of the meditation. It's what you understood. It's what you grasped, and taking that and transforming the way you think, and beginning to imagine the word of God. See, the, the thing was, Joshua was about to step into the promised land to face some real enemies. He was about to face some real giants. And he was going to need to be able to transform into Bumblebee, transform into Optimus Prime. 
In other words, Joshua was going to need to have something inside him to come out of him. My final point, and I'm, cl- and I'm closing, is you can't make withdrawals what you didn't deposit. Mm. There is no press this button and life becomes easy. Doesn't exist. Those are called scams. We can't live life expecting something to happen and make withdrawals from within us and withdrawals from the kingdom when we didn't even make a deposit. See, in Matthew chapter 12, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, actually, let's just jump to 35, verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure. That word can mean deposit. A good man out of the good deposit of his heart, watch this, brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil deposit of the heart brings forth evil things. I want to close with asking you this question. During this time of quarantine, stepping into the rest of 2020 and beyond, do you want to get there? Do you want to move from here, wherever here is for you? Whether you're sick, maybe you've got a a sickness that has been bugging you for years. You just got to hate it. You got to start getting over it. I'm done. I want to get from here to there. I don't want to go through the same thing I've been going through. You got to get a little angry at this and say, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to start making some deposits. I'm going to start making some deposits. I'm going to start putting the chisel in the potter's hands. I'm going to start letting God prune me and God transform me. I'm going to endure the pain because I know it's good for me. Because the only thing that's hurting is that pride and that self-centeredness. And God is cutting it away, forming me into this beautiful statue of David. If you've never received Jesus into your heart,